Hey, you lovely lot, and welcome back to Crime Analyst and the Intelligence Cell and my YouTube channel. And I just want to start off by saying thank you so much to those of you who have subscribed. And if you haven't done yet, then what are you waiting for? And please do share my content with others. You never know, it might just save a life. Today, I want to discuss the kidnapping of nine-year-old Charlotte Senna. And I also want to talk about Craig Nelson Ross Jr. Now, this case is important. Well, firstly, it has a very good outcome in that Charlotte has been found safe. And I'm really happy about that because when I was posting about the case on social media and asking people to help, this was a case in New York State, um, I was really worried about the outcome. Because of the statistics that we know of in cases where children go missing and are abducted, and I'm going to tell you about the statistics of what we know from these cases and why time is just of the essence and so important when children are abducted. So Charlotte was found two days later, and that is such a rarity, and I'm extremely happy about that. But what I will also tell you is that we don't know what she was subjected to in that time and also it would have been very traumatic for her to have been taken from her family who were camping in the park, Morrow State Park in New York State over the weekend. And I'm going to tell you about exactly what happened but I do just want to lay a marker down that it would have been traumatic. So when people are saying, well, she's been found safe and healthy, we, we just don't know. And for her family, it was, they're thrilled that she's been found, of course, but it was an agonizing two days when she was missing. And they put out a statement and said that they know that this isn't the normal outcome that most families get, and they're very thankful for that. They also thanked all the search and rescue personnel and federal and state and local agencies that worked so hard to recover Charlotte and to find her. And of course, social media people did play a role. And I was one of those people who saw that she was missing, was very concerned and was putting her picture out across social media because you just never know who may have seen something or knew something and, you know, as a mother, I know that these cases are just every parent's worst nightmare. They really are. And I really want to focus on what happened and, and tell the story about what happened, but also focus on him, on Craig Nelson Ross Jr. And normally I don't focus on the perpetrator and he has been charged, but normally I don't focus on them because many do seek notoriety and um, they're normally less than and they want to be more than in terms of what they're doing. But I think in this case it's quite important. And one of the reasons why is that, well, he's 46 years old. And what I do know through all my casework is that I've not seen it yet that someone starts their offending career, that they abduct and kidnap a nine-year-old girl at age 46. I've not seen it yet. And of course there might be the 1% of cases that may happen, but I've certainly not seen it across my years of working cases. And I immediately suspected that there was some form of targeting involved. And when I say targeting, it normally means I'm talking about stalking, when someone's fixated and obsessed with another one and or another person. And that can happen. It can be that, that it's predatory stalking. And that's where we tend to see sexually motivated types of offences and it can happen within hours or a day. It doesn't need to be weeks, months or years. So that can happen. This did feel, and I discussed it with Jim Clementi, that it could have been impulsive and yes, it might have been opportunistic, but what's transpired since leads me to believe otherwise. So I'm going to share with you what I believe happened and also the police are still appealing for information. They're still piecing together the timeline. Now, you've heard me talk so many times about how important the timelines are in cases like this. And the police are still trying to piece together that timeline from when Charlotte went missing to her being found in his trailer, which was 
behind his mother's mobile home. Now I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'm going to start with telling you firstly what happened for those of you who don't know. And if you do know, well, there might be some other details now that have come out which um, might be new to you. But I think certainly appealing for key information and just, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit more. So Charlotte was last seen at around 6.15 p.m. on Saturday the 30th of September. Now, her family were camping in Morrow State Park. And I don't know whether that was a normal trip that they would take. I don't know if it's something that they did, for example, most weekends or annually. So, but they were camping there and Charlotte was on her bike. She was with some of her other friends. She decided to do an extra loop around the park or not the actual park, but around the path. And 30 minutes later, she hadn't returned to her family and her family started searching for her. And they then found her bike abandoned on a park path and they became very alarmed and they notified police. Now, less than 36 hours after she went missing, a man drove to her family's home address, and that was around 4.20 a.m. on Monday, and he slipped a ransom note in their mailbox. Now, that's very important. The ransom note was examined and fingerprints were found and I also believe it was f fingerprints were found on the mailbox and they matched Ross, Craig Nelson Ross Jr. Now he had previously been fingerprinted in 1999 for driving whilst intoxicated and the police then housed him to a camper van which was at the back of his mother's address. So she has a mobile home and he was at the back of it and that mobile home is about 30 minutes from the park, a 30 minute drive, I should say, from the park, which is important. Now, thank goodness Charlotte was found. They searched both uh, the mobile home and the camper and they found Charlotte. She'd been tied up and she was in a cabinet, so she was hidden. So that tells us that he didn't want her to be found and so she had been, she has been recovered and that's great, like I said, and she was reunite, reunited with her family at the hospital. She was examined medically and reunited with her family and they held off from interviewing her for some time because of the trauma. And of course she will be interviewed by a trauma informed child abuse specialist. So we still don't know what happened. And what I will tell you is that Ross has been charged with kidnapping and there is an expectation that more charges will follow. Now, this ransom note, there's been a lot of attention paid to that by the media and about his financial situation and that he couldn't keep up with his house payments and that he moved into the, the camper van at the back of his mother's house and that he has multiple sclerosis. And there's this whole sort of poor me syndrome dialogue um, and narrative forming in the media. But I have to say, as soon as I heard that, I just didn't buy into it. I just don't believe you would abduct a nine-year-old girl. I don't know the circumstances of the family. And when I talked on Real Crime Profile with Jim and Lisa, I said, we don't know whether she's a high value target. What I mean, all children are high value, but what I mean in terms of financially, was this about finance or was it something much more sinister? And because I believe through my history of working cases, this is much more about stalking and it being motivated by that that was what I initially believed and of course I will look at any information that says otherwise and this is an ongoing investigation so I will just say that there will be information not known to me at this time but I do know how important the timeline is and well the police are seeking more video footage and camera footage from people. So if you're in the park at the time or around it, what they've requested, they want video footage or it can be eyewitness testimony, whatever it might be, from the hour where Charlotte was last seen. So she was seen around 6.15 um, on the Saturday, the 30th, and from there in the park to um, the pathway were the park to the residence, so the route that would be taken. 
Um, of course, we don't know how he got her off her bike. We don't know how he got her there. It sounds to me like it was much more likely that it was a vehicle. We don't know whether he spoke to her beforehand. We don't know the full circumstances of that, but she was found in a residence and it sounds to me like he would have had to have transported her by a vehicle. So the police are seeking any information that people might have who are in and around the park or near the residence of the mother's address. And I am looking at my notes here because I think it's quite important when appealing for information, obviously to be accurate about the time. And so if you were in the park at that time or if you know anything, then please do um, let the police know. And where the police are currently, well, he, Ross, has been remanded without bail. He's due back in court on Friday, the 6th of October. And so I think it's important to focus on him because targeting a six-year-old, sorry, it's targeting a nine-year-old girl, as I said, well, that has all sorts of red flags and warning bells ringing for me. And I do believe that he has a much more extensive history. I said that at the time. And I said it on Real Crime Profile, do go over and check out our video there where we're talking about the case. And I said that it sounded like stalking to me and that she was targeted and that I just did not buy into the whole financial motive and that this was financially motivated in this ransom note. What I do know is that the family directly appealed to the person who took Charlotte and they also reference prayers for that person and to please return her. And, and maybe he saw that and maybe that's why he decided to go down the route of this whole ransom note. But it, it is incredibly, um, what I would call, it's criminally unsophisticated. So this is somebody who didn't think through everything. He hasn't most likely done this to its full conclusion in the past, but there may well be near misses where he attempted to do it and things that people were concerned about his behavior and it's these near misses these sorts of things that i'm asking people to think about he's very distinctive looking six foot four and to call in if you do know anything and when i was talking to jim and lisa i was still searching and, and researching the case and i tend to go very deep on cases when I do a deep dive but this was something that we did in the moment and I was still piecing together some of the information because of course it's a fast moving investigation but what I did find was that a neighbour, so a neighbour called Carol Brown who lives close to the mother's residence, she lives down the road from where Charlotte was recovered, she said that she had a problem with, with Ross in the summer and she said that she had her grandson her young grandson who was playing outside in the yard and she went outside and she found this man standing right over him with his back to her now carol said that she confronted him and then he left but she said she felt she was this close to something bad happening and normally as i always say trust your instincts because they're normally accurate so this is exactly the type of thing that i'm talking about when i mention near misses now Today I was searching um, for further information and I also discovered that Ross has a history of DV. Now that does not surprise me at all and what was, what's been reported on was that the police said that he reportedly applied pressure on the throat of the victim during an altercation. Now, I always know that DV, there's never just this one-off, it's always a pattern. And when you're, you get to hands around the neck or applying pressure to the throat, hands around the face, as I've talked about with Gabby Petito, any attempt to asphyxiate or to control by, by placing pressure on the breathing apparatus, well, this is a high risk factor to serious harm and homicide. And in fact, it increases the risk sevenfold. And I'm gonna say that again it increases the risk sevenfold. This is a high risk factor. Once hands go around the neck, they rarely de-escalate. It only gets worse. So it's really important to take it seriously. And domestic violence, you rarely get a one-off. And I'm not gonna call it an incident because it's a pattern. These are patterned crimes. And that's why it's so important to look at histories. And I expect that there's much more in his background so if you know anything, please do call it in. He is very distinctive, six foot four, 46 years of age. I mean, he looks like this archetypal, quite frightening, creepy guy. 
and if you can help the police do contact them and what I'll also say is what we know about cases and you know like I said this had a very good outcome for Charlotte we don't know what trauma she's gone through but in terms of her being found alive well that's a rarity and I said I'd mention the statistics just to underline that time really is of the essence in these cases so we know that 44% of children, when they're abducted, they're killed in the first hour. We know that 73% are killed in the first three hours and 99% in the first 24 hours. And Charlotte was missing for two days and that's why this is a rarity. It's why Amber Alerts are so important. It's why reporting early is so important. So do think about that with future cases. I'm trying to get this information out there to all of you. I also just want to mention, again, it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month and I am running masterclass training sessions, which are virtual, and you can join me on my Dash masterclasses. I'm just gonna remind myself of the dates. I always have so much on, but I have a domestic abuse, stalking and harassment and uh, honor-based abuse, risk identification assessment and management masterclass that will run on October the 17th and 18th. I train the trainer for Dash on November the 7th and 8th, and then Coercive Control, a masterclass on December the 5th and the 6th. And like I said, these are virtual. So if you do want to attend, I share my knowledge and my expertise, my journey of 27 years. And um, these classes, with those who've attended, they, they really are a lifeline. It would change the way that you understand victims' behavior, but also perpetrator behavior, and they are a lifeline. So. Please, if you're interested, you can contact Laura Richards, PA at gmail.com. So I'm going to end there. I'm thinking about Charlotte. I'm thinking about her family. And if you know anything, please do call it in. And please stay safe and look after yourselves. Okay, until next time, be curious, ask questions, and always trust your instinct.